Welcome back everybody. As you probably guessed, what we're going over today is this rifle right here that you see in front of me and that you guys have seen being shot throughout the intro in the thumbnail and the title. This is the Springfield Armory Hellion. And basically, what is it? Well, it's a Croatian made Springfield Armory imported bullpup rifle that has some military provenance to it. A version of this has been used uh, by the Croatian military for a long time, the VHS rifle. It's a little bit different. Uh, we'll probably talk about some of the differences here as we go along. But first and foremost, what is a bullpup? I'm sure a lot of you guys out there watching this don't know that. So uh, basically what that means is we have our magazine well behind our trigger. It also means that we have linkage that goes from the trigger that you actually touch, that you interface with, to where the actual trigger is in the gun, which is actually back here. Um, so what that does is it gives you a very small overall package while still uh, retaining the 16 inch barrel. So you get a 16 inch barrel, so you get full 5.56 velocities, at least as of what most folks would consider full 5.56 velocities, but you get a package that is pretty darn short. This rifle here, when it comes uh, from the factory with the four prong, four prong rather, flash hider, is about the same overall length as a 10 and a half inch AR-15 or a Mark 18 for those that are familiar with that. Um, but you don't have to deal with any of the National Firearms Act nonsense that we have here in America. So there are definitely some advantages to it. There are definitely some disadvantages to it that we will talk about here in the video as well. But I've had this one in now, I believe, since October. So uh, quite a while, uh, probably eight, or eight months or so. And uh, we have just over 2000 rounds through it. So quite a bit and a good bit of experience with it. I have some opinions on it. Uh, we took it to a couple training classes. We took it to a USCCA uh, training class. Unfortunately, I don't have the footage from that. They said they'd give it to me. They didn't. Anyway, um, but we've been shooting it a bunch on our own as well, gathering data. So I suppose before we get into all the details of the rifle itself, what I think of it, all of those sorts of things, let's head out to the range and see what kind of accuracy we can get with a few different loads out of this rifle, and then come back and sort of walk through it piece by piece and let you guys know the details on this particular rifle. Now we're gonna find out what kind of groups we can get with this setup. So what we have here is a primary arms one to eight. Uh, this is their platinum scope, so fantastic glass. I can't be mad about it at all. It's got the Griffin reticle in there. Uh, obviously OSS, or Huxworks rather, can on the end. Uh, stream light light and everything else is factory in the gun right now we have some 45 grain hollow point uh 223 from remington they are our rifle ammo sponsor for this video we definitely appreciate it but it is a light for caliber stuff and then we have a couple other loads that will run through it target is down range at 100 yards we are using a ctk precision rest and uh i suppose we'll see what it'll do So it's not a bad group per se, but I'll tell you that one that went well was definitely me on the trigger. And that is kind of just a function of bullpup triggers. I mean, obviously there's a human factor in every uh, bench test, but uh, with a bullpup trigger, it gets a little bit trickier than, than usual. So up next, we have some, uh, a little magnet on a seat. You might need to have, oh, there you go. A short mag just, not friendly to that mag one, but it fit, so I had to smash it. So up next, we have some barns uh, loaded with uh, their 62 grain TSX boat tail bullet, nasty little bullet, and uh, we'll see how she likes this all copper offer. Not bad there on that load. And the last load up is going to be some uh, Winchester loaded up with their 223, obviously 223 chambering rather, loaded up with the 69 grain Sierra Match King hollow point boat tail. As I always say, it's one of the most consistently accurate rounds, regardless of who loads it. I think Federal loads this as well, um, but that bullet just seems to do really well. But you never know, every gun's its own animal, so I well, like that mag just fine. I guess it just doesn't like the short ones, um, but we'll see how she does. Go check it out. I'm definitely happy with these groups for sure. First up, of course, we had that Remington. Like I said, that low one was totally me. It really was, I felt it immediately. But right there, center to center, 
or just under two inches, like an inch and seven eighths. Then we had that Federal 62 grain load. Nice little group there. And center to center, it's an inch and an eighth on that one. And then we had our uh, 69 grainers, which like I said, always does well. And this thing is a shooter, guys. This is a bull pup with that trigger that just shot this group. Center to center, it is right at five eighths of an inch. Nasty, nasty group. With the accuracy portion out of the way, let's get into the details of this rifle. And there is a lot, it's not just a standard AR-15 review that I typically do here on the channel. There's a lot going on with this rifle, both good and bad. So out here on the front, we'll start there and sort of work our way back. So right now we do have an A1 flash header on there. So that way we could run our Gentech silencer on there that works with those mounts, A1 and A2. Um, but it does come from the factory with that flash header right there. It is a four prong flash header. The barrel of course is threaded half by 28. This is one of the best factory flash hiders, if I'm dropping it, but this is one of the best factory flash hiders out there on the market, period, in my opinion. It's phenomenal. It does an excellent job at hiding flash. And one thing with this particular rifle is that you don't really need any type of compensation or recoil mitigation uh, just due to the design that we'll talk about here and the way the rifle recoils. But very, very good flash hider. I am a fan of it for sure, but again, it will take any of your standard AR-15 flash headers. If you want to run a break on there, you certainly can do so. Um, we have done a complete clean and lubrication video where we've gone over the disassembly of this uh, rifle. So I'm gonna kind of uh, steer you guys to that if you guys wanna see a complete breakdown of it. But for expediency in this video, we're just gonna roll in photos and stuff like that so you can see. But on that note, the barrel itself, like I mentioned, 16 inches, 5.56 chambering. It is a 4150 CMB steel. It is cold hammer forged, and then it has a melanite finish on there. Melanite is a type of nitriding or uh, nitrocarburizing. And what that does is it gives you good surface hardness, good corrosion resistance. And uh, what you'll see on this one here, of course, we have a one in seven twist barrel as well. Um, but what you'll see here is you'll probably see in the photos some it looks like corrosion on there and that's from shooting it suppressed uh, a lot of that gas is coming back in there it wipes right off but just know that the melanite is going to do a good job at preventing any type of actual corrosion going on in there and that tapered barrel does help with the balance of the rifle so overall the rifle itself is just under eight pounds on my scale that uh, is naked i should say and of course, when you load up an optic and stuff like that, it starts to get a little bit heavy on you, but with the bullpup design that does mitigate some of that, that we will talk about here in a second. But the barrel is phenomenal. As you guys just saw, the accuracy was fine. I do believe that the actual military version of this has a chrome line barrel versus nitrided, but again, here in America, that is what we have. Continuing on back, we do have an MWOC handguard. That is, again, one of the differences between this and the military version of it. Uh, the MWOC handguard is great. It has uh, MWOC positions at the three, six, and nine o'clock position. There's some pros and cons to it. Some pros, obviously, MWOC, it's lightweight. Um, and so you can add whatever accessories you want. That said, it does have these steel reinforced QD sling points right here on both sides. And what that does, when combined with the way the polymer is molded here, the polymer kind of sticks out a little bit further on top than it does down here on the bottom. So trying to mount a light can get a little bit tricky there. We had to go with an impact weapons components mount, but a lot of your inline mounts, they simply won't work because of the way the polymer is there. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're thinking about how you want to accessorize it. What would be perfect for this setup is one of the new Surefire Scout Pros. Uh, the way you can kind of articulate it, it would work very, very well on this. I just didn't use one throughout this review. We use the impact weapons uh, components mount with the Streamlight rail mount one. It worked just fine. Continuing with some interesting stuff at the front of the rifle here, we do have an adjustable gas block. Now this is a short stroke piston operated gun and the way they actually do the gas block is very smart in my opinion. So it has the standard version or the unsuppressed. And then when you open it up to the suppressed and all you have to do is push in and turn and uh, to change it, when you put it on suppressed, all it does is it has a bleed off valve on the gas block. We should be rolling in photos here that you guys can check out. But all it does is just bleed off more gas out the side, which again, as we talked talked about one of the reasons you guys see that sort of uh, corroded material on there, which is just carbon, um, is because we had some serious gas bleeding off shooting suppressed when we were actually using the Gentech silencer, we were using the OSS silencer. Of course, we had it on the standard 
uh, i.e. unsuppressed position with that flow through can and we didn't have to mess with it at all but it is a good option so that way you have you know you can adjust it with the silencer that you have because i do think uh, you know it's 2023 as of when i filmed this silencers are going to become more and more common in america one way or another so it's good that it has that option especially being a bullpup because out here of course is where the brass is going to eject and if you had a lot of gas coming back in there, uh, it would be going right in your face. You'd be getting a ton of gas to the face, but with that gas block there, cutting the gas off, even with a traditional silencer, there's no gas in the face, at least not bad anyway, when compared to other competitive offerings out there on the market. We're gonna go over the adjustable gas setting here. So we have right now it on the standard gas setting, so IE unsuppressed, some Remington 45 grain, 223 in there put a few rounds down range. Then we're gonna throw a traditional Gemtech style can on there. Uh, good high back pressure can and see how it does, but just let you guys see the ejection here first as a baseline. All right, now we're gonna throw that can on. Nothing has changed with the exception of putting that Gemtech halo on there. Same ammo, same everything, same suppressor setting. So put a few rounds down range, let you guys see what that looks like. It's definitely got a little bit more punch to it from the shooter's perspective. Now we're gonna throw it on the suppress setting. Basically, you're just gonna push down on the gas block or the gas setting, I guess you could say. Rotate it over so that the S is facing up at the 12 o'clock position, and now we will see. I have no idea how that looked on camera, but I'll tell you, from a shooting perspective, it absolutely feels normal, if you will, with that suppressor on there. On the suppressor setting, it feels kind of like I just had the A1 flash header like we started out this segment with. So the adjustable gas block certainly does work. You might get a little carbon on your hand, from it coming out, but it works just fine from a function standpoint. Definitely much better than being over gas with the standard setting. Here on top, we do have these HK style sling attachment points in addition to the QD points here that we already talked about. Uh, on top here, we have this piece, which is for mounting optics, and it also contains our iron sights. And the iron sights on this gun are phenomenal. They're some of the best on the market, period. Uh, they're right up there, in my opinion, with the SCAR, and I say that as a compliment. SCAR has fantastic iron sights, as does this gun. One of the things that you are going to notice versus say like an AR-15 is that with your sights on there, and the same is going to be true with an optic, you'll note that we do have a higher height over bore. You know, with an AR-15, you're looking at two and a half-ish inches. This one is higher. So when you go to zero, you just kind of have to keep that in mind, particularly when we're shooting at close in distances. But the iron sights themselves are adjustable with no tools. We have a very fine front sight there, which makes accuracy with irons much easier in my opinion. And of course they are metal and fold down. It also has that good, strong metal hood on there. And then the rear sight is adjustable for windage, but you can also dial it in for elevation. So you can walk it in sort of, uh, for those of you guys who are GWAT veterans or who are familiar with the MaTeX rear sight, similar concept, different execution. It does so with the different diopters here on the drum, but for, you know, both distance as well as you can open up the diopter for a low light setting, they're just excellent excellent iron sights now for cleaning and maintenance the top piece here completely lifts off so that is easy makes it easy to get into the guts and then additionally this is our charging handle so the controls on this rifle are interesting <laughs> a lot of them i really like some of them i don't really like one of them i'm ambivalent about is this charging handle so it's completely ambidextrous you can push it either way right side or left side pull it back and that is how you run the bolt now there's no bolt hold open button like on the exterior of the gun but it does have a bolt hold open function both with magazines when you're out of rounds it will hold open and then additionally there is a button inside the magwell which i don't know if i can even get a shot of it basically in there there is a button you can feel it if you reach up in there and you push up on it and it will hold your bolt open now when you go to reload this is something i don't like for sure this is a con of the rifle in my opinion to, to actually send your bolt home this is the button here you pinch these two things together now 
it's relatively hard to do as I'm sitting here in a static environment with absolutely no stress using my dominant hand. When you're trying to do it in the pocket of your shoulder, as we will try to recreate here, lock the bolt open. And so you come in, insert a magazine, and then you're gonna come up here and do this with whatever kind of kit you might have going on, a sling going on, and you're supposed to do that. My opinion, that is just not good. And what I do when I've been using it is I've just basically come up here and run the charging handle like you would on an AK so that we don't have to fumble with this. I think it's faster, it's more consistent. Um, and then speaking of the charging handle, one thing I should also talk about is that this also acts as a forward assist. So if you want to bump it forward, if it's not all the way in, you just basically grab this at a 90 degree angle, then you can push forward on it or you can just push forward on that level that lever there rather. Either way, you do have the ability to have a forward assist with it. I should also note there that underneath this rear sight, once again, we have steel reinforced QD sling sole points on it. So very, very well thought out in terms of attaching QD points. And additionally, while we're at it, let's talk about them here in the rear. You have them on both sides as well. And one thing we should also talk about with this gun, I kind of hinted at here with the charging handle is that the rifle itself is 100% ambidextrous not just in terms of controls, but also in terms of ejection. So you can actually swap the ejection to the right or left side on this gun. It's very easy to do. All you do is rotate the bolt 180 degrees, rotate the cam pin, put it back in, then you switch out your actual lever here, which I suppose we can get to uh, when I actually move the camera a little bit to let you guys get a better look at that. But 100% ambidextrous rifle. So if you're a left-handed or right-handed, it doesn't matter. Everything is in the same place, as well as you don't have to worry about having ejection in your face if you are a left-handed shooter. We've already touched on the controls a little bit, and one that I do want to talk about here is this actual selector lever here. So I have pretty large hands in most gloves. I wear extra large, sometimes double extra large, but just to give you a frame of reference, I have zero issue at all manipulating the safety with my right or left hand. I don't find it to be a problem with a standard grip. That said, I know people, other folks who have large hands that say they have to adjust their grip to get to it. I would imagine if you have smaller hands, you're going to have to completely rotate your hand or come up and hit it like that. Um, I've read, again, a number of people complaining about that. For me, it is completely a non-issue. As you can see here, I have zero issues manipulating it at all. That said, uh, a very simple polymer part that I would imagine the aftermarket can take care of if these rifles become popular enough. And basically all they would have to do is instead of having it swept up like that, just kind of sweep it down a little bit. And then even folks with small hands would have an easy time actuating it. But again, for me, not a problem at all. For a lot of people though, I do think it will be. Uh, obviously the grip on the pistol, or the rifle rather, is the BCM grip. It's one of the more popular out there, very ergonomic. And uh, of course, if you wanna switch it out with any other AR-15 compatible grip, you can do so. The trigger guard is a little bit enlarged versus say your standard AR-15 trigger guard, but it's not huge. Um, but if you have gloved hands, you'll probably be able to get in there and work that trigger just fine. Let's talk about the trigger. Make sure we are unloaded and put our safety on. So basically in here, you have complete slop. There's just nothing going on. You're not putting any input at all into the trigger itself. And keep in mind, this is your trigger shoe right here, but the actual trigger itself is back here. As weird as that sounds. So there's a linkage bar going all the way down this rifle. And when we go ahead and we hit our wall, that's our wall, but there's still a good bit of creep even after that. Now, for a bullpup trigger, in my opinion, it's not bad but it's not good <laughs> compared to other rifle triggers. On my scale, it breaks pretty much consistently between seven and a half and eight pounds. And your reset is long, but it's very tactile and audible. Then you get back on your wall here. And again, there's just creep and not, not crispness, if that's a word. And that is your break. So what I would say is for a bullpup, it's a good trigger Com compared to non bullpup rifles. It's a very bad trigger. I suppose do with that what you will. It's functional though, and you guys saw the groups that we were able to get out there. Speaking of groups and speaking of practical use, one thing that you do get with this rifle being a bullpup and the way the magazine is versus where the grip is. So if, for example, right, if you look at the IWI Tabor or X95, one thing you get that's different is your hand placement's very different. Your hand placement on the Tabor is more like here. So the length of pull on this particular firearm is 
kind of excessive. Um, and what makes it even stranger is that they do have an adjustable stock on here in terms of length of pull. I don't know anyone. I mean, you would have to be huge. I'm six feet tall, just for reference. I mean, you would have to be like Hickok 45 size or bigger, like six, eight or bigger before I could ever see you wanting to extend that stock. I mean, the length of pull is very long. And what that does is when you're in the prone position with the magazine back here versus having your hand back here and more weight back here and more stability when you're all that way forward, um, it just makes it awkward to shoot from the prone. When you put that magazine in the ground and sort of monopod it to get stability, it's better than nothing, but it's awkward. And it's not as stable as you would have with like an AR-15 where your magazine's in front and you monopod it. Um, the stability is just not as good. So in terms of like impromptu engagements at distance uh, without a bipod out there at the end, which of course you could do, it has that M Lock 4 end, you could put one on there, but without a bipod on there, the practical accuracy is gonna take a lot more effort in my opinion than your AR-15 would. Uh, that said, of course, it's a more compact package. There's pros and cons to each for sure. Continuing back to the stock, we already touched on the adjustability of it. You do have that ability. I just don't know anybody that would. You also have this cheek riser here, which is a pro and a con in my opinion. So the pro of it is that you get a good wide area to rest your face on. There's not like a piece of metal, like on like an underfolding AK, for example. It's the worst example I can think of. That's just smashing your face. It's very, very comfortable because you have that wide area, sort of like a B5 SOP mod. The downside of it, in my opinion, is that they tried to make it um, like adjustable. Uh, so you can adjust the cant and everything. You can, that's absolutely true. But it's kind of janky in there. I personally have left it in the lock position just because when you try to play with it, it just kind of flops around on there. It's not that solid. And I don't really know anybody that's going to want to move it. All the reviews I've watched, I've not seen anyone that has it set in the up position or anything like that. Everyone just kind of leaves it down and I get why. While we have it up though, what that does expose is this piece right here. I'm not gonna pull it completely out, but you can. You can pull this piece out here and that is the locking lever for the dust cover. So as it's in right now, again, we're ejecting to the right, but basically just pull this out. That will open this dust cover. Then you can close the dust cover on the right side, push that in here, and that will lock this one open, uh, closed rather, excuse me. And what that's doing again is, particularly when suppressed, but even when you're not, it's preventing that gas from coming in your face if you have it, you know, i.e. if I'm shooting like this, it has the left side locked in the locked position, so that way there's no gas coming in my face as I'm shooting when the gun is cycling. So again, I do like that. The stock though, I just kind of wish they would just kind of keep it one piece just like that and leave it. Uh, continuing on though, here on the stock, we do have these, again, old HK cloth style sling mounts, but again, most people I think are gonna use the actual QD points, but you can use those claw mounts if you want to. It does give you that option. Now, one control that we didn't talk about is going to be the magazine release. So let me grab a magazine so we can discuss that. We have our handy dandy Mr. Guns and Gear magazine. So one thing to note is that this magazine well is removable. So the HS products version over in Croatia, from what I understand, they originally used the G36 mags and they changed over to a proprietary uh, HS products mag. So right now they use a proprietary mag over there in Croatia on the military version as well as the Iraqi military version. But this mag well is removable. So it really wasn't a big you know, issue for the folks over there in Croatia to change it to take your standard AR-15 mags, which it does take. Now, one problem I'm gonna put forth with that is that since it's just one piece that you can literally pull out, why didn't you flare the mag well? But they didn't. Uh, so my guess is they didn't flare it for that reason right there. When you're actually on it, you don't want a flared mag rail hitting you in the wrist. That said, you could have flared it a little bit and kind of had a little bit more wrist contact, but a little bit easier insertion. However, to actually remove the magazine, you just press this button right here and it comes out. Do they drop free? It's 50-50. Some of them drop free, but in my opinion, since you're gonna have to come up here to hit this button anyway, you might as well just grip and rip it and then go to work. As you can see, there is a slight flare in the polymer, but in my opinion, they should have put a little bit more on that. And just like the safety, that's something that could easily be fixed by the aftermarket if someone chooses to do that. One thing that's tough to display through a camera here is just how compact this is. So just to give you guys a frame of reference, I know there are a lot of people that have 10 and a half inch AR-15s, whether they be Mark 18s or something like this, like the Stag 15. If you can see in the brace in the closed position, that is the length of it when it is all the way up. And even if we extend the brace all the way out, you guys can see there, it's still, shorter uh, than this particular rifle by about a half an inch, but that is it. 
And again, so you're essentially giving up about a half an inch in length in this position with a 10 and a half inch AR, but you're getting that full velocity from a 16 inch barrel. So that's not insignificant in terms of terminal performance, particularly at range. Now, I know a lot of folks are gonna say that this rifle here copied the G36. I really don't think they did, um, but there's definitely some inspiration and the folks at HS Products certainly have seen a G36. As you guys can see here, just kind of some similarities is going to be that ambidextrous charging handle. This of course can also be used as a forward assist on it. And you guys can see, obviously we have a removable optics rail. Now this one here is not really the same and in my opinion hs products makes a better product here particularly when you uh, consider that it is t marked on top and then also has the ability to have better iron sights built into it i'm sure hk could do that as well and i know some of their variants did do that um, but in this particular example if you had to compare sort of the top rail this one is just a better product in my opinion all the way around additionally the handguard modular versus the hk but hk has improved on that over the years this is an older version but i just kind of wanted to show those two just to give you guys points of comparison on some things that we have talked about so far one thing we didn't talk about is sort of night vision capability i realize that's somewhat of a niche category but one thing that is nice about this particular top rail here is that it's not dependent on a barrel nut or something like that like you would have on an ar-15 so if you wanted to mount light laser whatever the case on there or even on the handguard for that matter it's not going to shift around like it would on some handguards on ar-15 some don't some do as you guys know that's probably a topic for another video um, but it obviously the rifle itself does have the capability to do it just fine let's talk about some things that we haven't covered so far um, again disassembly and stuff like that check out my video on that uh, again this video is probably long enough as it is but this rifle right now in the united states has an msrp of 1999 dollars so it's not cheap when you compare this to a lot of ar-15s you're talking about a pretty high-end ar-15 uh, for a similar amount of money how has the performance been? Well, the performance on this particular one, you guys saw the accuracy. Uh, the reliability has been 100% reliable. Without question, I've had zero malfunctions of any kind with this gun. The majority of that has been Remington 45 grains, uh, which is a hollow point as well. So some, some guns have a hard time with the feed ramp on that, not this one. Uh, we'll roll in a photo here, but this one of course has the star chamber type design with good feed ramps in there and reliability like i said 100 percent. so you cannot do better than that we have over 2,000 rounds through this rifle and so reliability is good accuracy is good in terms of shootability shooting characteristics when i was out at that uscca course everyone in the course besides me had an ar-15 so guys were running braked ar-15s comped ar-15s and we were doing time drills rather uh, under the clock trying to hit certain targets at a certain distances and stuff like that when we got close when the targets got close and speed was a priority the piston design here i think just slowed me down a little bit piston recoil regardless bullpup or not is just a little bit harsher that's my opinion anyway than the di the di tends to smooth stuff out so if you were trying to win three gun competitions this might not be the best option for you but for just about anything else that you're going to do you're not going to notice that difference um, obviously inside of building inside of a vehicle in and around structures you know there are obviously techniques for handling longer guns and you know world war ii there's a whole lot of buildings that were cleared with a garand but no doubt about it, all things being equal, a shorter package is simply easier to maneuver with. And this absolutely meets that. Additionally, one thing I mentioned earlier is that it's not the lightest gun. However, with a bullpup design, uh, most of your action is back here. Additionally, as you guys saw, the barrel has a tapered design to it. So out front, we really don't have a lot of weight. And with your sport hands here, you're not really holding a lot. A lot of it is being held here by your shoulder pocket. And in terms of like staying up on target for a long time, very, very easy to do. Uh, pros and cons, like we mentioned earlier. Uh, one thing I do not like, I really wish they would just have a mag release button i don't like it and i personally just skip this thing in practical use and just run the charging handle like we talked about that is probably the biggest con for me and sort of an awkward thing for me is the length of pull but it's not a con for me it's just a little bit weird other than that i think we've covered pretty much everything important on the rifle if you guys have any questions that we didn't talk about definitely let us know down below in the comment section you can also post those questions over at my various social media sites that you see here on your screen 
Um, if you guys are think rather that you're following me on a Mark Zuckerberg platform, you're probably not. They've deleted all my accounts, close to a million followers. Yay. But anyway, we have new ones. So there's new ones here on your screen and you guys can follow me there. But I do recommend you follow me on Twitter, Telegram. Those are definitely the best in terms of a lack of censorship. Uh, we post deals on these things. If these things come in stock, like I mentioned, the MSRP street price is going to be 1550 to 1650 right now is the one I'm recording that, this video that may change over time and when these are on sale we post those social media we post them in our daily deals email which you can sign up for here at the link on your screen it goes out every day as the name indicates and it has six to eight of the best deals that we find around the internet it's in that email it's the cheapest I know of anywhere on the internet on that particular day so it saves you guys some time because I've already done the looking for you and hopefully saves you some money as well additionally you like this video uh, definitely hit the subscribe button if you've already done that and you're not seeing two to four videos a week here on the channel make sure you sign up for my email at the website here on your screen it's a different email list this one goes out once a month and it has all of the videos since the previous month's email so that way there's no big tech giant censoring your eyes for my content and i'd recommend you use a non-gmail email for that because gmail tends to block a lot of my emails it is what it is um, but we don't fret about it regardless Thank you all for watching. I truly appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing everyone in the next video.